Good afternoon. Happy New Year to everyone. Thanks for coming to the quarterly medical board meeting. I want to ask all of us to please turn our cell phones to silent and make sure they're off the table so we can avoid feedback noise. I heard that it was difficult to hear, so please, for the board members, please speak into uh, microphone when time comes. Uh, you may notice board members accessing their lap laptops during the meeting. They are using the laptops for the purpose to access the board meeting material that are in electronic format. This is an official business meeting of the Medical Board of California. As such, disruptions of the board's business will not be tolerated. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comment and ask for public comment on each agenda item. I ask that you be respectful to the, of the need to conduct the board's business. Should anyone disrupt the meeting, I will ask the person to conduct him or herself in such a manner that permits the board to transact its business. This meeting will be available via teleconference. Individual listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by a moderator who will be facilitating the teleconference process. For those members of the public participating via teleconference, please wait until the moderator has introduced you before you make your comments. To request to make a comment during the public comment period, plus press star one. You will hear a tone indicating you are in the queue for comment. If you change your mind and do not want to make a comment, please press the pound sign. Assistance is available throughout the teleconference meeting. To request a specialist, press star zero. Each person will be limited to three minutes for agenda item. During agenda item two, public comments on items not on the agenda, the board has limited the public comment period for individuals and the teleconference to 20 minutes. In addition, public comment from individuals here at the meeting will be also limited to 20 minutes. Therefore, after 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During public comment on any other agenda item, 10 minutes will be allowed for comments from individuals on teleconference line and those in the audience. After 10 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. Business Services Office staff will be assisting me with receiving the public comments via teleconference during this meeting. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda, and it is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on the agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please raise your hand or come forward and you will be recognized. I would like to request all speakers to complete a pre presenter slip so I can call you by name at the appropriate time and, that rec and the record of this meeting can be full and complete. However, this is voluntary. Uh, please give your slips to Ms. Toof. Ms. Toof. Uh, I will uh, <clears throat> do my best to call upon everyone who has supplied a slip for the agenda item and recognize those who wish to uh, make a last minute comment. We plan to end the meeting around uh, 6 p.m. I would like to introduce Kim to introduce. Uh, Um, in the audience today, just some special guests that we have is um, Karen Fisher, who's the Dental Board Executive Officer. We also have Sarah Mason, who's the consultant for the Senate Business Professions and Economic Development Committee. And then we also had, well, we had Christine Lolly. So I think she just stepped out from DCA Deputy Director. Welcome. Thank you for coming. I would like call, to call the meeting to the order and ask Ms. Toof to please call the roll call. Dr. Bolot? Present. Dr. Bishop? Here. Judge Feinstein? Here. Dr. Hawkins? Here. Dr. Kraus? Present. Ms. Lawson? Here. Dr. Levine? Here. Dr. Lewis? Present. Ms. Pines? Here. Ms. Sutton Wills? Here. Mr. Warmoth? Here. Ms. Wright? Here. Dr. Yip? Here. Dr. Gonadev? Here. We have Thank everyone. Thank you. We have a quorum. Whoa. <clears throat> Moving to. Agenda item two, public comments on items not on the agenda. Speaker slips, we have any? 
first one is Ruth Haskins, uh, president of California Medical Association. Ruth, uh, welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome to Sacramento. My name is Dr. Ruth Haskins, and I'm currently the president of the California Medical Association. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist. I practice in Folsom, California, and I have been a licensee of this board for over 30 years. CMA represents over 43,000 physician, resident, and medical student members in all modes of practice and specialties representing the doctors of California. Our association is dedicated to promoting the science and art of medicine, the care and well-being of patients, the protection of public health, and the betterment of the medical profession. CMA values and appreciates the excellent working relationship that we've developed with this board and your staff. While the, our organization might not always agree with the board on all issues, the board's willingness to solicit and respond to intake uh, input from the stakeholders has been critical to establishing a healthy dialogue around our shared goal of ensuring that the patients of California have access to uh, safe and high quality medical care that's provided by experienced and well-trained physicians. For example, the CMA particularly appreciates the board's collaboration and support on the passage of Senate Bill 1177, which provided the authority for the board to establish a statewide physician health program California patients and physicians need the support and assistance of such a program this can provide. Quality health care depends on a healthy physician workforce, and the board's recognition of the need to address physician health has been critical to highlighting this important issue. CMA looks forward to working with the board to develop and implement the regulations that will make this program a reality. As we enter this period of change and uncertainty for health care delivery, both at the state and federal levels, the board's role supporting physicians and their patients will be even more important. Combined with the board's upcoming sunset review, we recognize that 2017 will be a very busy year during which the board will be responding to many new state and federal proposals related to the practice of medicine. We look forward to continuing to work with the board, providing the perspective of the practicing physicians of California. Thank you for having me here and welcome to our city. Thank you, Dr. Haskins, and uh, it will be board's intent to work with all stakeholders. Thanks for coming. Any other comments? Any comments on the phone? Comments on the telephone. Just, just a point of information for the board, and Dr. Haskins' presence kind of pr reminded me of this. Next week, February 3rd, is the second annual National Women Physicians Day. Um, this this uh, uh, recognition uh, occurs on February 3rd, which is the anniversary of the birth of Elizabeth, Elizabeth Blackwell, the first woman to matriculate as a, in, in medical school in the United States. And uh, I think California can be very proud of the extent to which it has um, incorporated and welcomed and included women physicians um, in every aspect of the d delivery of care in this state. So I just wanted to be sure board members were aware of this. Thank you, Dr. Levine, and uh, we do also appreciate Dr. Haskins for involvement in that, uh, in that item so our, for a long time. Yeah, I'm just still waiting to see anybody, any comments on the phone. Thank you. Okay, this was a very quick open session before we go to closed session. <laughs> We're back on time. Uh, pursuant to Government Code Section 11126A1, the board will meet in closed session to conduct the annual evaluation of the executive director. So we are going into closed session, please. Everybody leave. Thank you. Okay, we are uh, back in uh, open session. Uh, the board has completed the evaluation of the executive director and uh, 
Kim, I'll sit down with you afterwards, one-on-one, -on -one, and go over, but I want to announce that uh, the entire board gave Ms. Kirschmeyer outstanding evaluation and appreciates your work. Thank you for all you do. We'll now move to the agenda item four, approval of minutes of October 27, 28, 2016 board meeting. Move approval. Second. Okay, any discussion? Any comments from the members here? Any comments on the phone? No comments on the phone. Okay, Ms. Tooth, roll call please. Dr. Bolat. Aye. <clears throat> Excuse me, Dr. Bishop? Aye. Judge Feinstein? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Kraus? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Dr. Levine? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Yes. Ms. Wright? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Now we'll move to agenda item five, which is the president's report. In the past quarter, Ms. Pines and I worked closely with the staff to complete the board sunset review report and uh, ensured it met the deadline submission of December 1, 2016. Well, all of you know that uh, I'll be in the hot seat in the BNP committee, so I'm ready. <laughs> I would like to take a moment uh, to thank the board staff for putting together this document. It was a lot of hard work and the board appreciate the hours that were put into it. In addition, Ms. Pines and I have continued to have telephone calls with the executive staff to discuss projects and issues that have arisen during the last quarter. We know that the next few months will be very busy with the board sunset hearing. We'll be meeting with the chairs of uh, chairs and members of Senate and Assembly BNP committees prior to sunset hearing. Our goal is to educate the members on the board and its new issues as well as to answer any questions the members may have. We'll also suggest how can we make the disciplinary process faster. I think it is one of my <laughs> biggest concern is that the time it takes to finish and I do want to make sure that we make a difference both for the public protection and also for the physicians to get peace of mind. This year will be a busy year as uh, there are a lot of projects that are planned to be completed throughout the year, in addition to resolving any issues that may arise through sunset process. I also look forward to developing a new strategic plan this year that will provide guidance to the board for the next several years. This is a very important project and I look forward to working with the Department of Consumer Affairs through the process. Board's mission of consumer protection is so important that we want to make sure that all of the goals of the board focus on this mission. As you will hear tomorrow, board staff held a, an interested parties meeting to discuss options for patient notification regarding physicians and probation, and also to hear from the parties on regulatory language to establish the board's physician health and wellness program. These are important issues for the board and we look forward to future meetings and discussion on these issues. The board continues to reach out to both public and physician groups to educate them on the board. I have had opportunity to provide presentation to physicians about the importance of laws contained in the Medical Practice Act and ensure that they know the laws and remain in compliance. I believe that education about the board is one of the most important aspects of my role as the president and I want to ensure myself, other members and staff provide this presentation to any group that is interested in having board, uh, board present. Just to give you, I did make a presentation to, to California Association of Neurosurgeons and also at uh, uh, the medical staff at uh, Kaiser Fontana Hospital. Uh, in my mind, our goal is to education is the one which is the most important before the discipline. If you can prevent one doctor doing some dumb things to get his license or her license in trouble, I think we've done a tremendous job. According to uh, many studies, it will cost anywhere from $1 million to $2.6 million to train a doctor to the society, not to the physician. 
Medicare alone sp spends $15 billion on uh, graduate medical education per year. So this is, a, uh, this is expense to the society, so we need to make sure that uh, uh, we protect our investment. Uh, they, they, they don't make mistakes. Plus, prevention is an ounce of prayer. Prevention is better than a pound of cure. If we can prevent one doctor hurting a person, I think we've done a great job. Since the la last board meetings, there have been no committee assignment changes. However, if any member wishes to change their committee assignment, please feel free to contact me or Ms. Karshmayer. Uh, is there any public comment for this uh, from the audience? Any public comment on the phone? No comment from the phone. Thank you. And uh, we'll go to the uh, agenda item six, board member communications with the interested parties. Do any members have anything to report? Okay, I just want to emphasize the same thing, which I almost say every meeting. I do get involved with multiple organizations. Uh, I'm, the, I'm a board member for AMPAC, which automatically puts me as a board and executive committee member for CALPAC. I do meet on a lot of issues, but we will not discuss about medical board, which is a totally different issue. And we have a public comment from uh, Marian Hollingsworth. Marian. Okay. It was for the last year. Yeah. Thank you, Marian. <laughs> Any comments on the phone? No comments from the telephone. Thank you. The next item is uh, agenda item seven, which is, I'm sorry? I think it was Who? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Kerry. Kerry always keeps me on my toes. <laughs> Um, the next item is uh, agenda item seven, which is presentation regarding supplemental survey and physician medical participation. We are fortunate to have a, a great working relationship with the University of California, San Francisco, to assist in obtaining this information. I would like to introduce uh, Janet uh, Kaufman. Dr. Janet Kaufman is an associate professor at Philip R. Lee Institute of Health Policy Inst Studies, the Health Force Center and the Department of Family, Family and Community Medicine at the UCSF. Dr. Kaufman has authored numerous publications on supply and demand on healthcare workers, geographic maldistribution, and strategies for Im improving racial ethnic diversity among health professionals. She has been the project director for three voluntary surveys of California physicians conducted in partnership with the board that have addressed physician participation in medical and use of electronic health records. Dr. Kaufman received her PhD in health uh, services and policy analysis and a master's degree in public policy from uh, University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Kaufman, thank you for being here today. Please right. go ahead. And thank you, Dr. Ganadev. Um, and I'll ask the board's indulgence. I'm recovering from some sort of cold, flu something, so I apologize that I'm a little nasally and I may need to just take a little bit of a break at some point. I hope you took flu vaccine. I, well, see, this is the irony, doctor, is I took the flu vaccine and then I caught this thing from my husband who doesn't believe in the flu vaccine. Uh. <laughs> Anyway, it, uh, it we go. So thank you very much. And as as, Ms., as uh, Dr. Ganadev indicated in, in his comments, this really is, I think, a, a great partnership that we at UCSF have had with you in the medical board um, in terms of partnering with you to do um, surveys that add to the information that you already collect through your mandatory surveys. Um, and today I'm going to talk about some work we did in 2015 on physician participation in, in Medi-Cal. And of course, the, the reason that this uh, was of interest to us and I think of an importance to the state is that California is one of 32 states that have expanded eligibility uh, for Medicaid for all citizens with incomes uh, below 138% of the federal poverty line. Um, and that approximately one in three Californians is now enrolled in Medi-Cal. In turning Medi-Cal expansion into access to care 
requires adequate numbers of providers who accept Medi-Cal patients. That having an insurance card is, is important, terribly important, um, but just having an insurance card doesn't necessarily get you the access to the right care in the right place at the right time. Um, and so this work is going to build on work that we did uh, on a previous supplemental survey in 2013, the results of which uh, were published in this report. Um, and I should note, too, here that we're, as you all know, at a critical juncture. There's tremendous uncertainty about the future of Medicaid at, at the federal level. Um, it's possible the expansion will be repealed. It's possible uh, that the program will be block granted. So a lot of uncertainty. So we've got a few slides here that also speak to um, physicians' willingness to care for the uninsured. And I think that's those findings have become even more important given that we're at a place that the state could possibly risk substantial federal funding uh, for Medi-Cal, and it's not clear whether the state would be able uh, to make up that funding. In fact, I think it's fairly clear the state couldn't make it all up. Um, so methods. This was a voluntary survey mailed to physicians whose licenses were due for renewal in June 2015 uh, to December 2015. And so these were mailed out, sent out with the um, renewal packets and with the mandatory survey. And so it is voluntary and it says, admittedly in small print, um, that it's voluntary. Um, but uh, there it is. Um, we linked responses to the voluntary survey to responses to the mandatory survey and data on the, in your core license file. So things that have to do with age and gender, um, location, uh, and such. Um, and then we analyzed responses from physicians who practice in California. We we're interested in just focusing on those who are here in California, those who had finished their residency, finished their training, and who provided patient care at least 20 hours per week. We really wanted to focus in on those folks who were devoting uh, a large chunk of their professional activity to patient care. So we weren't, for example, looking at someone who's in biotech primarily doing research. Um, and so the survey went out to 34,212 uh, physicians. Then among the, and that went out to everybody, including those who weren't really eligible for our survey. So for example, you've got, as you know, there are folks who have active California licenses who are overseas or who are in another state. So they got the survey, but we didn't look at their responses because they weren't the folks of interest to us. So we got 6,000. Uh, 162 usable responses for a response rate of 18% among our eligible physicians. This is considerably lower than the response rate we've had from previous surveys. And, you know, we, I think it's really fair to say that this is a function of the transition to the Breeze uh, system, which I'm sure you all have heard a lot about <laughs> uh, of late. And because of the Breeze system, our online version of the survey was did not pop up online right after the rest of it. Previously, when the medical board had had its own uh, software for the online renewal, our survey popped up at the end. And yes, it was voluntary, but it was right there. There was no extra effort to fill it out. We now had to, and we want to thank the staff. The staff was tremendously helpful in figuring out a workaround. But the workaround involved having doctors click on a link and go to the medical board site put in some of their license, I think their license number, some information. So it was just enough more work that I think there were docs who, who said, well, if this is, I'm not, I'm not going to go to that extra work. Um, and that was unfortunate, but there were, I think, understandably, some limitations in what the Breeze system could do, at least in the early going. And, and we'll want to be talking to, this, to Ms. Kirschmeyer and the staff to see whether that might change in the future. Okay, so now to, to results, and I'm going to focus mostly on acceptance of new patients. And the reason for that is in the context of the Medicaid expansion, a lot of folks new to Medicaid, um, many of them new to insurance for the first time, that it seemed like one of the most important questions was could folks get a new patient appointment. So on this slide on the left, we have all physicians, and then in the middle primary care, and then on the right, non-primary care. Um, so just focusing on all physicians, and we looked at four insurance statuses, whether you had private 
insurance. Now this could be Kaiser, could be Anthem, could be any private insurance. Um, we looked at Medicare, and again, that would be any Medicare. Could be Medicare Advantage, could be traditional Medicare. Medi-Cal in the green, and then purple, the uninsured. Um, and just focusing on the all physicians, I think what, what we see here is that 60% of the respondents said they would accept a new Medi-Cal patient versus 85% of privately insured versus 77% of Medicare. So less likely to accept a Medi-Cal patient than Medicare privately insured. If we go over and look at the purple bar, the uninsured, only 38% willing to accept a new uh, uninsured patient. So I think the message here is while access for Medi-Cal beneficiaries is not all that we'd like it to be, um, it's better than access for folks who are uninsured. And then if we look at the primary care physicians and the non-primary care physicians, the point estimates are a little different, but the pattern holds. Okay, one question that we have been asked is, well, okay, the physicians are accepting new Medi-Cal patients. Well, are those new Medi-Cal fee-for-service patients or are those new Medi-Cal managed care patients? So we had questions that asked, well, do you accept new Medi-Cal fee-for-service? Do you accept new Medi-Cal managed care? And if you see on the slide here, the bar on the right, 71% of the physicians who accept a new Medi-Cal patient said they accepted both, that they'd accept new fee-for-service and new um, Medi-Cal managed care. But there are some minorities that only will see new fee-for-service or will only see new managed care. Um, some of that new managed care only, I suspect, may be Kaiser where primarily the patients that you're going to see in Medi-Cal or any insurance are folks who are in the Kaiser plan. Um, this slide takes those two lumps of primary care and non-primary care physicians and then breaks them out into eight groups here. And we see, and they're ranked from highest proportion accepting new Medi-Cal patients to lowest. And so the highest is what we call facility-based specialties, and this would be emergency medicine physicians, pathologists, radiologists. I don't have the slide here with me today, but we've been lately looking at the emergency medicine physicians separate from the other facility-based physicians, and we'll see that the proportion is higher, that the emergency medicine physicians are the most likely to accept new Medi-Cal patients. Well, why might that be? Imtala. You know, as those of you who are involved with hospitals know, EMTALA requires all emergency departments to assess and stabilize, you are, you know, regardless of the patient's ability to pay. Now, on the bottom, the least likely to accept new Medi-Cal patients, psychiatry. Now, there are certainly some psychiatrists who see Medi-Cal, but I think psychiatry is the example, probably the most bifurcated specialty where you have a group of psychiatrists in the public in mental health system and in the non a certain part of the nonprofit sector that do a lot of medical do a lot and if anything maybe do a little more uninsured care for more uninsured patients but then you have the part of psychiatry um, that's either all privately insured or in some cases all self-pay among those folks who are able to pay for their mental health services out of pocket, the, you know, the more of the worried well, perhaps. Um, and then all of our other specialties in various places in the middle. And we also decide, looked at acceptance of new Medi-Cal patients by practice type. Um, and so five types here, um, physicians in community public clinics, the most likely to accept new Medi-Cal patients. No surprise there, the mission of those clinics is to serve low-income people most of whom are on Medi-Cal or uninsured, so I, that's you know, consistent with what you'd expect. Um, towards the bottom, solo practice, only 44% of physicians in solo practice willing to accept a new Medi-Cal patient. The next two slides look at primary care physicians versus non-primary care physicians by region of the state. Um, and this is the primary care physicians. And I should say primary care, the way we've defined it here, is family medicine, general practice, general internal medicine, general pediatrics. Um, and here we see the highest proportion with any, accepting any new Medi-Cal patients uh, is Inland Empire. Dr. Ganadev's part of the state. I, I, I think I know the comment. I, I know actually for everything, not just primary care, including specialties, is that IEHP is the main 
Medical Managed Care Plan. Mm -hmm. They pay the physicians significantly better than Medical rates, and their bureaucracy is a lot less when it comes to authorizing. So mm -hmm. th those are the reasons why Inland Empire has the highest acceptance. Great point. Hold up. We'll come back to that thought a little later. Um, a good point. Um, the lowest proportion accepting new Medi-Cal patients, and this was a little bit of a surprise to me, is the North region. So we're talking Mendocino, Calusa Butte on North. Um, it's the, lo the, the lowest percentage. Um, I don't know that we know why. I know for a while Shasta, which is the main community clinic in the Reading area, for a while they stopped taking new Medi-Cal patients because, well, they were feeling they were so overloaded that that their executive director and their board made a decision that maybe we should just focus on the patients we have. We don't like doing this. We don't like turning people away, but at the same time, we don't want to get so overloaded that we're not providing quality care. Um, this is the non-primary care physicians, a little less variation here. Um, Inland Empire actually is close to the top, but not quite the top. Um, the Central Valley Sierra and North Valley Sierra would kind of be Sacramento down to Stanislaus County and the lowest percentage being San Diego County. And I think probably what you have in some of our more metropolitan counties is you have some segmentation of the market, that you have some doctors working in places like LA County, USC, some non-primary care docs who are doing a lot of Medi-Cal, but then you have folks, let's say in Beverly Hills, who just aren't. They can keep their practice you know, plenty full without Medi-Cal. Um, so this is to look at any patients. So to say, well, regardless of whether you're accepting new Medi-Cal patients, are there any Medi-Cal patients in your practice? And I think we see here that the pattern looks pretty similar to accepting new Medi-Cal. Um, that again, um, you're less likely to have any Medi-Cal patients than private insurance or Medicare, but more likely uh, than uninsured. Um, the one difference that's not statistically significant is in the primary care physicians um, and this is really uh, a function, I think, of having pediat in this case, the way we've done it, combining pediatrics with general internal medicine and family practice. That in pediatrics, you just, pediatricians don't see very many people on Medicare. It's very rare that a child will qualify for Medicare. Um, and so there's a chunk of physicians who just don't, who, of, of what we're defining as primary care physicians, who just don't see Medicare because they take care of, of children for whom that's just not an, typically an insurance option. Um, and then this slide is to get at the question, well, to what extent of our, to, among our physicians that are serving Medi-Cal patients, to what extent are they serving them? What's the concentration of patients? So I want to call your attention to sort of the rust color at the top. And so those are physicians who told us 30% or more of my patients are enrolled in Medi-Cal. And it turned out that about 28% of the primary care physicians said that 30% or more of their physicians were on Medi-Cal versus 19% of the non-primary care physicians. And so we have chunks in both groups that don't take care of any Medi-Cal. Then you have these groups in the middle that it's, you know, 1% to 30% of their practice. But then there's this minority that's, do, that's very heavily um, providing service to folks on Medi-Cal. Um, real quickly, a couple benchmarks for assessing the adequacy of the supply of uh, physicians. Um, the Council on Graduate Medical Education made some estimates 20 years ago, and they're not perfect, but they're ones that are widely used. Um, and then the California Department of Healthcare Services, this is our agency that runs our Medi-Cal program, they have a requirement for their managed care contracts that there be 50 primary care physicians per 100,000 beneficiaries. There's nothing similar on the specialist side, but that is their sort of benchmark on the primary care physician side. Um, and so how do, we, how do we stack up in Medi-Cal? And so we've got primary care on the right, excuse me, primary care on the left, non-primary care on the right, and we looked at our data from the 2013 survey compared to the 2015. And remember, this is the, pet, this is the time period where the number of Medi-Cal beneficiaries is going through the roof because of the Medi-Cal expansion. And what we see is the ratios of primary care and non-primary care physicians per beneficiaries are going down. Now, we did do some looking. There is some growth in participation among physicians, but it's not nearly as dramatic as the growth in beneficiaries. So that's pulling the ratio down, and it looks like we're below DHCS's uh, requirement. Now, 
DHCS will tell you that, oh no, we couldn't possibly be below the requirement. And perhaps that's true on, or perhaps that's true, perhaps that's true on paper, but this is what the physician, you know, we're basing this on what physicians are telling us about their participation in Medi-Cal. Um, this year with the, with the 2015 survey, we added some new questions. And the first one was about referrals. So we asked physicians about their experience for referrals for privately insured patients relative to Medi-Cal patients. Our hypothesis was that primary care privately insured patients would probably be the easiest folks to get referrals for because the private plans tend to pay the most generous rates. So we thought, well, let's look at that comparison and then let's look at diagnostic imaging. Let's look at referrals to specialists. And so this could be PCP, to specialist, or it could be specialist to specialist, like let's say you're in rheumatology and you've got a patient who you think might be a candidate for joint replacement and you want to get an ortho consult for that, or you're an endocrinologist managing a diabetic patient who is developing retinopathy issues that you feel needs uh, an ophthalmology consult. And then lastly, mental health services, and what you see here I think clearly as that the physicians told us they had substantially more trouble with referrals for all three services uh, for Medi-Cal patients. I mean, I think it's also concerning that they reported uh, that 17 percent reported having difficulty referring privately insured patients for mental health services given what we know about the importance of mental health. Then we asked physicians questions about why you limit the numbers of Medi-Cal patients in your practice. Now some don't, again, some in, in emergency departments or in community clinics are taking all comers, um, but we know that there, are, we know based on our findings that some are limiting. So we said, well, what, why is that? Well, the number one reason uh, was the amount of Medi-Cal payment. And they could check, there were six, six options, they could check off as many as they wanted, and um, these are folks who said that this was a very important or moderately important reason. So one was the amount of Medi-Cal patient. And as Dr. Ganadev's alluded to, there are some of the Medi-Cal managed care plans who are paying physicians substantially more than the fee-for-service rates. So it may well be that those who didn't see this a problem were doctors in Inland Empire and other places where they're being paid better. But that was the number one reason. The second was administrative hassles. And Dr. Ganadev, you alluded to that Inland Empire Health Plan has been able to streamline, is not as bureaucratic as others, but I think certainly talking to physicians, particularly about the fee-for-service side of Medi-Cal, there's a lot of administrative paperwork, you can be slow to be paid, that there are things that understandably discourage participation. Um, and as indeed, delays was a separate question and delays was also a frequently cited reason. Three less frequently cited reasons were that Medi-Cal patients have complex needs. Um, some cases that's true, other cases not so much. Um, practice is full. I think it's a signal that some practices are, are, have as many patients as they want without taking all Medi-Cal patients who might seek care. Um, and there were 20%, one out of five, who thought Medi-Cal patients were disruptive. Now, we didn't define that. We just left it out there. Uh, for uh, them to interpret as they would. Okay, well to wrap up, because I know we want to get to your questions. So to, we found that California physicians are less likely to accept new Medi-Cal patients than new patients with Medicare or private insurance, but more likely to accept them than uninsured patients. And, that the, and we found that the number of full-time equivalent Medi-Cal physicians that grew between 2013 and 15, but did not keep pace with the increase in Medi-Cal beneficiaries. Um, and that the supply of Medi-Cal physicians relative be beneficiaries appears to be below state and federal standards. Um, physicians more likely to have difficulty obtaining referrals for Medi-Cal patients than privately insured patients, and that uh, concerns about payment rates and program administration were the most frequent reasons that physicians limit the number of Medi-Cal patients in their practices. Um, some important limitations. We relied on self-reported data from physicians. We didn't do any chart reviews or audits or anything to verify this. So this is what physicians self-report. Our response rate this year was low. 
and, and that was disappointing and hopefully something that can be solved if we're able to continue working with the board in the future. Um, we also don't know whether physicians are answering questions about acceptance of new Medi-Cal patients from the perspective of having ever accepted a new Medi-Cal patient. Was this like ever something you would do versus are you accepting new Medi-Cal patients at the time they completed the survey? And I think this is important. We don't know this and I think reality too is I think in some of our larger practices our physicians are a little removed from the decisions that are being made about what types of insurance the practice is accepting and may not always um, know exactly um, who which insurances are being accepted today. But I still think it's important, you know, that physicians' perspectives are important to take into consideration um, as we look at these questions around participation in Medi-Cal and also as we look at questions about care for the uninsured. And so I'll stop here. I want to thank the board. They've been a tremendous partner. Thank our funders and thank our research team. Thank you, Dr. Kaufman. I, uh, excellent presentation. I, uh, I, got, I got coupled and I'll ask the rest of the board members if they have any questions. So uh, one slide which stuck out for me was the percentage of practice uh, Medi-Cal patients so 19% on specialties, you can see how low it is compared to the, what the percentage of Medi-Cal in California is. A third of, one out of three patients in California have Medi-Cal. Mm -hmm. So that's what the number is. So you have about 33% patients are Medi-Cal, but 19% of specialist practice is Medi-Cal. That's a significant access problem. Well, actually, I just wanted to correct you. So it's 19% 19, 19 of specialists who, whose practice has 30% or more. Okay. So it's 19% that really have a critical mass. It's a higher proportion, 68% that have some Medi-Cal. But some Medi-Cal might be, oh, we take care of one or two Medi-Cal patients a year versus I'm at Arrowhead and I see a lot of Medi-Cal patients because that's who Arrowhead serves. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm just, I was looking at the, the number of the, the, what percentage of Medi-Cal patients in doctor's practice. So if only 19% has that 30% and above, mm -hmm. that's a fairly low number. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's worrisome. Yes. Um, just uh, and a, and a question for you is, uh, did it, improve significantly from 2013, even though the numbers are smaller, or what's your uh, thought I would process? say from 13, uh, the rate, well, the ratio of full-time equivalent Medi-Cal physicians to Medi-Cal beneficiaries fell. Okay. And that would be the, the, this slide here. So the supply of full-time equivalent, and, 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 and this is, the way we did the full-time equivalent was to look at what physicians told us about what proportion of their patients were Medi-Cal and convert that to an FTE. So if you said that 30% of your patients were Medi-Cal, we'd count you as 0.3 FTE for Medi-Cal. If you said 10% of your patients were Medi-Cal, we'd count you as 0.1 and then sum you all up and then take a ratio of that to the number of, benefi to the ra number of beneficiaries. So, so how much did it fall? Um, so for primary care, it fell by uh, 20 primary care physicians per 100,000 beneficiaries, and it fell by uh, 26 per 100,000 beneficiaries on the non-primary care side. Those are significant numbers. Very, very significant. And I think the thing to keep in mind is that this is a period, I didn't bring the graph with me, but if you plot Medi-Cal enrollment, I mean, this is a graph that goes kind of like this. It's very big ramp up in a short period of time because the Medi-Cal expansion just really substantially increased the number of Californians who are eligible. Um, and while there has been some uptick in physician participation, instead of a line that goes like this, it's maybe a line with a much short, smaller slope. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Sorry. So did you correct for the percentage of time that physician was actually working? Um, in this analysis, we didn't. We treated everybody who was working 20 hours or more the same. I, I don't have the slides with me, but we did do an additional analysis to correct it. And the, con the point estimates changed, but not the conclusions. Right, because, right, because if it's, you know, 30% of a half-time practice, mm -hmm. that's not, a, that's not, you're right, you're right. For that. 
You're you're right. You're right. Uh, but as I said, when we adjusted it, it didn't make that much difference. And did you include in here um, uh, uh, nurse practitioners, advanced practice nurses who are actually primary care providers? So that is a very good question. The answer is no, because this is a a, a survey that we do in partnership with you and the medical board. Um, we are doing some other work where we're pooling. Um, some of the medical board data with data on physician assistants and NPs, and we'll have a report on that out shortly. Um, because that may be part of DHCS's um, contention that actually, if you look at the supply of primary care providers, uh -huh. it's not let, you know, it's. Right. I, I actually, I don't think they've made that argument. It would be a reasonable argument. Um, and I think indeed um, NPs and PAs are, are pretty, you know, pretty well represented on the staff of community and public clinics and are doing uh, uh, quite a bit of primary care. Um, what we don't, I mean, what we can do from some sources is get some counts of NPs and PAs, but we don't have the data on their participation in Medi-Cal. That would require partnering with those boards or in some other way surveying those professions. I mean, it's an excellent point, but we don't have the richness of data um, on NPs and PAs that we have on the MDs. Brenda. In connecting the dots, are you finding then that there's a bottleneck of, of availability for, for Medi-Cal appointments? You, in an earlier slide, you were talking about the availability of, of patient, new patients for Medi-Cal uh, referrals and a lack thereof, is there a bottleneck at some point or are you not looking at that? Well, we, we were asking physicians about their acceptance of new patients. We, you know, have not surveyed patients, but I think our findings are consistent with, say, the California Health Interview Survey, which does survey the public and folks on Medi-Cal who respond to that survey generally report more difficulty obtaining access to a physician than people who have private insurance. And I think there's certainly a lot of um, anecdotal reports in the media about difficulties accessing appointments uh, with both primary care and specialist uh, physicians for folks on Medi-Cal. If I can follow up, is there a, is there a way to um, maybe harmonize some of the information that you have with the information that's accessible to, you know, from a patient standpoint to make it more helpful in, in problem solving? Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and what, how, what can we do to make that helpful? Um, this is a good question. I'm not so much so sure how much the medical board itself um, could do, um, but I think what we could do, and perhaps with the medical board's willingness for us to collaborate and share information with others. Um, we've certainly done presentations with the folks who run California Health Interview Survey, and we might think if there's some way to pool some of our information and do some joint publications, that's certainly something we could look at. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Hawking. So I'll be curious what your survey will show in 26, for 2016 if you do it, because in Los Angeles County, we have a private practice, and I do general medicine as well as pulmonary medicine. The substantial number of Medi-Cal patients are managed Medi-Cal. Right. And as long as my IEPA accepts those patients, we see them. So mm -hmm. they are getting better access to primary care. They're getting better access to specialists because you have a specialist panel. They have to take those same patients too. So I just wonder whether what your statistics will be for next year where a greater percentage of some of the Medi-Cal clients are managed Medi-Cal where they're sort of forced into a system where um, and the doctors have to be available to take them unless they just buy out of the. Uh, the so care that's of a great that's a great question, and let's stay tuned. Dr. Kress. Thank you very much for this analysis. Uh, obviously, we share the common goal of wanting Californians to have timely access to high quality care. In this analysis, did you separate out uh, physicians who are available for many medi or dual eligibles versus those who are available for straight Medi-Cal? Um, we, we did not. In, in the interest of trying to minimize the complexity for the physicians, 
um, we didn't try to differentiate the medi medis from. My, my, my concern is that I know many physicians who badly accept the medi medis and write off the Medi-Cal portion, uh, and we really need to know what the physician supply is for, for those who will take just straight Medi-Cal. Mm -hmm. And when you say straight, you mean either the managed care or fee for service, but not the Medi Medi. Yes, mm -hmm. but not the Medi Medi. Okay, well, that's something I think we need, we are looking forward to sitting down um, with the staff on, and revising the survey. And so that would be something I think we would think about. I mean, I think another, if I will, another shortcoming is we did not separate out covered California from private insurance. We thought about that, and then we're a little worried about. Would folks, real, physicians, really understand that? But it, but if we had to do it over again, I think I would have tried that because I think there are, obviously have been some concerns about the level of access for the folks on a covered California plan versus an employer-sponsored private plan. Great. Uh, just one uh, last thing, Dr. Kaufman, is uh, if you could look in and see by eliminating public clinics and federally qualified health centers, see what the acceptance rate for Medi-Cal is. Remember that these two entities get paid significantly mm -hmm. higher mm -hmm. than a fee-for-service Medi-Cal for anyone. Sure. It's as high as three to four times for mm -hmm. the same type of visit. So that's why I'd, I want to see what is the available uh, availability of physicians for true either ma managed care or fee-for-service mm -hmm. eliminating the public clinics Mm -hmm. and the federally qualified health centers. That will give us a little more. And uh, when, when, the, when those payments, uh, you saw that 78%, mm -hmm. it was the payment, which is the number one. Right. Uh, I, I was surprised why 20% thought that uh, they were more disruptive. I, mm -hmm. I don't think they haven't seen too many private physician, uh, private practice patients who are not <laughs> as disruptive or even more. So that just, that, that just bothers mm -hmm. me that well, uh, somebody thought that uh, that Medi-Cal patients were more disruptive. So I, I think if you could do that, that will be great. Okay, and, that's a great suggestion. Because mm -hmm. you are right, we, you yeah, are right. Those incentives, you know, those payments are much higher. And so I think it's, I mentioned the mission, but I think it's a combination of the mission and then being rewarded by Medi-Cal for that mission. I mm -hmm. just want a comment from you on what if the way the Republicans are looking at uh, changing or uh, replacing ACA and uh, come up with block grants for Medi-Cal to state of California. What's your thoughts on that? Um, I think that that would be highly problematic because the history, I would say the history, I mean, in some ways it sounds good. In some ways, block grant gives you flexibility to say, okay, well, we as a state will decide how we're going to use this money to best serve our Medi-Cal beneficiaries. The challenge, I think, is that the history of block grants tells us is that block grants often do not keep pace with growth in, in the cost of delivering a service. So I think that's the big concern is whether we get, a we get a block grant and then the amount we get decreases over time or even if it stays flat over time as the population grows, um, that the state could lose a substantial share of federal funding for Medi-Cal under a block grant. And it would be, I think, impossible for California to sustain what we've accomplished um, without commensurate federal support. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from board members? If not, any any public comment? Yes, ma'am. Come on. For the reluctance, do you think the Medi-Cal patients who really uh, please come up here. Come on down. We are nice people anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, Mike. Here. No, no. Just uh, sit. Oh, if, if you want to sit at the other table at the mic. Oh, here we oh go. you got a microphone too. All right, first time I've ever done this. <laughs> um, medical students uh, often have tremendous, tremendous Please sit student, student loans. loans. And I mean, they're just like horrendous student loans. And I'm just wondering if the reluctance to take the Medi-Cal patients is related to the necessity of repaying their student loans. And if any amnesty on the student loans for their medical school could be helpful in accepting Medi-Cal patients. I mean, because those are you know, just from personal experience, those are horrendous bills. Thank you, Do uh, yeah, Dr. Yu. 
Um, the medical board actually, until now, we sit on the um, uh, the, the, well, the uh, health prof health professional education foundation. Their program that we actually give physician up to a hundred thousand dollar long write off mm -hmm. if they practice in a certain area underserved area. And as a matter of fact, if you're a pediatric surgeon who on staff at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles is actually considered underserved and would get that loan right off too. Not to mention you go to like Shasta County or some underserved area. There are they are they are the ways that the the, the student loan can be helped. Not only just for medical uh, doctor, for nurse practitioner, for PA, for um, nurse too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Any comments on the phone? Comment from the telephone. Thank you. Uh, moving to agenda num item number eight, update discussion and possible action of recommendations from midwifery council meeting. Ms. Sparwa. Hello. I'll be really brief because I know you guys have already read all of this, right? So at our last uh, midwifery advisory council meeting that was held December 1st, um, 2016, we were updated on changes, possible changes to the uh, licensed midwife annual report and decided to complete a survey that was going to be linked to the submission of data um, for that um, LMAR so that maybe we'll have a better response rate in, in terms of how licensed midwives would like to see their data collected. So that process is moving forward. <coughs> The um, midwifery assistant regulations, as you know, are going to be discussed in, I think, the next agenda item, so I won't go into that. Um, we continue to um, work with all the interested parties on coming to some sort of agreement regarding the uh, regulations pursuant to AB 1308. Um, and it's my understanding that a um, midwifery task force meeting has been set for March. So I'm, I'm really pleased to see that moving forward. Um, what I need from all of you today is approval for the following agenda items for the next MAC meeting, which will be held in March. Uh, task force update on revisions to the um, LMAR, update on continuing regulatory efforts required by AB 1308, update on the midwifery task force meeting, update on the hospital transfer form, um, discussion and approval of, of um, a new licensed midwife position which expires in June of this year, update on midwifery related legislation expected to be introduced or followed this year, update on progress of midwifery assistant regulations and an update on the midwifery program itself which is a standing agenda item. So I need a motion to approve those for our agenda please. Uh, any questions from uh, board members? Okay, any public comment? Any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone. Uh, Mr. Roll call, please. Dr. Balat? Dr. Bishop? Aye. Judge Feinstein? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krauss? Yes. Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. And then Dr. Ganadeb? Aye. Motion passed. Thank you, Kim. Not Ms. Toof, but Kim. Uh, moving to agenda Thank item. Thank you. Agenda item number nine update from Midwifery Task Force, Ms. Kirschmeyer. Well, I'm happy to report that we actually have a meeting set up for March 6th um, with our task force. And again, our task force members are Dr. Bala and um, Dr. Levine. So we will be meeting um, with members of ACOG and CAM at that time. Um, and again, the meeting is going to be held March 6th. So we were hopeful that we might be able to have a meeting before this um, meeting and we'd have more a fuller update. But unfortunately, what I can say is we will have a meeting then and it will be before the next Midwifery Advisory Council meeting. So that's our update for this meeting. Thank you, Ms. Koshmeyer. Are there any questions and comments from the board members? Seeing none, is there a public comment? Any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone. Thank you. 
Now we'll move to agenda item 10, discussion and possible action on amendments to propose regulation for midwife assistant, Ms. Webb. Thank you very much. Please turn to agenda item 10, and you'll see that I did a summary of the changes to uh, our proposed regulations that are moving through the rulemaking process to allow uh, mid licensed midwives and certified nurse midwives to use midwife assistance. And uh, when you look at them, it, it looks like they're have been major changes, but they've really just been reorganized as the bulk of the modification. Uh, but in addition to that, just some uh, housekeeping matters where we've added the, the note for the authority and reference below each proposed section. Uh, we are incorporating a document by reference, which will be part of our 15-day notice to alert people that a new document has been added to the rulemaking file. Uh, clarifying the minimum training requirements for a midwife assistant to ensure that they know they have to have uh, certifications in neonatal resuscitation, basic life support, and training in infection control. Uh, before they start working as a midwife assistant in addition to some other minimum uh, requirements. Additionally, similar to our uh, medical assistants, we've defined what a qualified midwife assistant is. This is someone who can train other midwife assistants because they have a special certification and we've clarified what's required for a certifying agency. That is a summary of the uh, changes in addition to some uh, non-substantive changes. And what I need, if you approve these, is a motion to allow us to do a 15-day comment period and if there are no substantive negative comments during that time period, allow the executive director to make any non-substantive changes and to move forward with the rulemaking process. Second. Okay, so thank you, Ms. Webb. Any questions from, uh, from the board members? Oh, you really are well versed with all those red lines. Uh, actually, when I first saw it, I said, what did we do? But it's all just back and forth, changed in where it went. Um, any public comment? Any comments on the phone? No comment from the phone. Uh, Ms. Toof, roll call, please. Dr. Bolot? Aye. Dr. Bishop? Aye. Judge Feinstein? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Aye. Ms. Lawson? Dr. Levine? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Ms. Sutton Wills? Yes. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Aye. Dr. Yip? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Thank you. Motion is approved. Let's move to agenda item 11 executive management reports. Ms. Kirschmeyer. As usual, I will not be going over the administrative enforcement program or licensing program summaries unless someone has a question. Both the licensing and enforcement reports have statistics and the highlights of each program in your packet. However, I do have a few items that I'd like to bring to your attention. Um, I'd like to draw the board members attention to page BRD 11A5, which is the board's fund condition. This document includes complete repayment of the outstanding um, loans to the general fund. As this document indicates, the board's fund reserve is projected to be at 4.9 months at the end of this fiscal year if the loan is repaid as projected. However, if the loan is not repaid as indicated on the fund condition on the next page, then we would actually be at 3.7 months reserve. In addition, without the loan repayments, the board would be below its mandated um, its mandate in fiscal year 1819, and but with the loans, we will not be expected to be below that mandate until 1920. 
I would also like to let the members know that the board submitted two budget change proposals or BCPA, BCPs to the Department of Consumer Affairs who then reviewed it and sent it to agency and then finally um, with final approval by the Department of Finance. Those BCPs were approved and added to the governor's budget. Um, so those became public on January 10th. So we will now be going through the legislative bud budget process for final approval. Those BCPs are actually for two enforcement staff in the board's central complaint unit. Um, you heard Ms. Romero talk about the central complaint unit today and we wanna get that time frame down and because of the additional complaints that we've received, um, that's actually an issue um, because we have more workload than we actually have had staff and it just continued to increase over the last several years. So that's why we asked for those two positions. And then the other one is a staff member to implement the physician health and wellness program. Um, in addition, there was a BCP to continue with the breeze system, and that's also indicated on the fund conditions, as you, as you will see that. And I'll continue to update the members um, through the process, through the legislative process, so hopefully by the July meeting we'll have good news that those have all been approved. I would like to take a, a moment to actually commend the board's licensing staff. The staff are currently reviewing applications within 29 days from the receipt of the application. As you know, their goal is 45 days. They're actually at 29, 29 right now. And actually over the last quarter, we had several weeks where they were actually at 26. Now we do know that this is our, not our slow time, but it is, it is not our crunch time, um, but we do commend staff for this. And really what they're trying to do is they're really trying to gear up for that crunch time. And I think we're gonna be in a really good position as all of those applications during that time come in and we have to license those individuals by June 30th. In addition, and this is actually something um, that we've been working on and I'm looking at Ms. Alameda in the back there and this is something we're really proud of, is that the board was actually able to drastically reduce the wait time for call, people calling into the call center. Um, there were a couple months, again, because of low staff and people not coming in, that we actually were at 22 minutes for a person to be on hold before they actually reached a caller. And we've brought that down to six minutes in the month of um, December. So we're really proud of that and the staff for doing that. In addition, we also drastically reduced the number of abandoned calls. So what actually was happening, I believe, is that people called in and what we did is we actually went through all of the scripts and all of the phone tree because we, you know, I, I was actually cold calling staff so they weren't really happy with me but I'd get on the phone and so um, I would see where, when is it, did it tell me that I actually was able to um, leave a call number, right? Because you can do that, you can request a call back, you don't have to wait on hold. How long in the process did it take to get there? Well we found out it was really a long time to get in and so we had a huge abandonment rate of calls. So that actually went drastically down in the month of December um, because of the changes that we've made with the phone system. So that's actually something I really wanna commend staff getting together and then they put together phone scripts as well so individuals know exactly what to say. And so we also, then the last thing we did in that unit was we actually sent all of our staff, no matter how long they had been to the board, with the board, to new employee orientation training where they actually had to sit there and go through two days of intense training on what each unit does. So, um, our phone, phone unit um, is, is definitely um, something to be commended in this last quarter. Lastly, for licensing and also for notification to members, um, I wanted to let you all know that Ms. Toof has been promoted to the Licensing Program Outreach Man Manager, which is Mr. Shunky's prior position. So um, as sad as we are about Ms. Toof leaving the executive unit, um, this is a promotion for her and we wanna commend her on that. So I will be filling her position within the next month. So if you call me and I'm angry, you'll know why. Uh. Um, so her replacement should be in attendance, hopefully at the April meeting. And in the meantime, though, please feel free to continue in our current process of contacting Ms. Toof. She is still um, t filling two roles at this time. Um, in the administrative summary, I identified several meetings and presentations that have been conducted, but I wanted to let you know of a future presentation that I will be doing. I've actually been invited um, to join a panel at a meeting hosted by the Food and Drug Administration in Maryland in May. Um, I'll be sitting on a panel with the Federation of State Medical Boards, the National Governors Association, and the University of New Mexico, talking about the board's requirement for continuing education on pain management. 
So the FDA is actually looking into the issue of opioid misuse and abuse, and they want to know some background on our requirement to have doctors take mandatory CME in that area. So I'm going to be um, talking on that panel. In regard to CARES, along that same line, as of January 15th, there are at least 76,000 um, physicians into the CARES system who's registered in CARES 2.0. And then several others who were in 1.0 but have not updated their information. Um, so we, there is a number that's there, but it's consolidated with pharmacists and everything, so we can't pull out which ones are just MD. So it's actually higher than that, 76,000. And actually, more important to me is that at the last meeting I reported um, in a one-month period in between September and October, there were actually 193,000 patient activity reports that were pulled. So that was the individuals going in and pulling the information. Um, however, between December and January, there was actually 208,273 reports. Um, so this is indicative to show that individuals, now that they have signed up for CARES, even without the mandate, because the mandate hasn't started with SB 482, they are using CARES system. So they're going in and pulling that information. Um, so that's really good news. And then at the last meeting, I did talk about the CARES education. There's actually a requirement that was um, introduced for the medical board that we actually have to do education to hospitals and to physicians on the usage and how to use the CARES system. So in early January, I actually held a meet meeting with the Department of Justice, CDPH, and other prescribing and dispensing um, DCA boards to talk about what that education would look like. So I'll be working with a small subcommittee to develop a brochure and information that can be disseminated. One item that was actually raised, and I thought it was a really good one, was that once a prescriber has requested a CARES report, what do they do with that information? So there are a few um, questions that came up about that, and we actually have um, pain management subject matter experts that have actually already been working with the Department of Justice, so we're going to work with them to provide guidance on what to do with the information once it's obtained. And I will also work with um, consultants with our board because we actually have some individuals that we use for those subject matter experts associated with the board and probably a few of the board members to be sending out that brochure before we release it and disseminate that information. And then lastly on CARES, on page BRD 11 D1, is a notice regarding the decommission of CARES 1.0. As the members may remember, when CARES 2.0 was released, there were several individuals, including some large health systems, that did not have the updated browsers required for CARES 2.0. So DOJ and the board did outreach to encourage individuals to update their browsers, and DOJ has now set a date for the end of CARES 1.0. That date's going to be March 5th of 2017. So we've posted the information on our website. We sent out an email to physicians. We sent a subscriber's notice. We tweeted the information, and lastly, I provided the information to all of our large physician organizations that we have contacts, and I sent it out to all of our physician members here asking you to try to disseminate that as much as possible. So are there any questions on CARES before I move on? Okay. So I'd like to draw your attention to page e 11 E1 to 2, and this is, provides an update from the Health Professions Education Foundation and the Stephen M. Thompson Loan Repayment um, Program. Uh, and um, we are just doing a written um, update at this time since we don't have any members on that foundation at this time. In my report, I provided an update on the issue of overprescribing psychotropic medication to foster care children. As stated, the board is awaiting approval from the Department of Health Care Services to finalize the data use agreement as required with the passage of SB 1174. In addition, for those physicians who the board has identified may be inappropriately prescribing, the board is working with the Department of Social Services to obtain authorization to get medical records for those patients. We've been contacted by the Department of Social Services and we'll be working with them to explain the board's enforcement pr process and what is needed. For the Federation update, I'd like to let the members know that the staff from the Federation actually visited the board's headquarters office in November. They met with, met with board management to discuss the FCVS process and also walk through the board's licensing process. The FSMB annual meeting will be held in April um, in Texas, and from the draft agenda, it appears that discussion will take place regarding physician wellness, medical regulation, and public health priorities, regulation in the era of, era of assisted dying, 
evidence-based regulations, telehealth, the role of CME and licensure, medical errors and reporting, and technology-supported medical decision-making, which all were interesting and something that's um, important to the board. So it's hopeful that Dr. Ghanadev and I will be able to attend. We'll be putting in um, out-of-state trip requests for that travel. Regarding the sunset review process, I wanted to let the members know that the, we provided the report to the legislative offices on November 30th, actually of 2016, not 2017, like the error I found in the packet. Um, but the next step will be the um, sunset hearing, which is scheduled for February 27th, um, probably around noon. So Dr. Ghanadev and Ms. Pines will be presenting for the board. And any of the members, please feel free to attend. Um, again, we don't have a time certain, but it's really dependent upon the boards that are in front of us and how long they take. Um, the Department of Consumer Affairs actually will be going right before us, and then we'll be following up. Um, I'm sure that they'll be talking to them about the vertical enforcement process. That'll, I'm assuming will be one of the issues that they bring up, so it'll be nice to have them right before us, and then we can um, tag team that issue. And then before I ask Ms. Miller to come forward, I think she's in the back, I saw her, and talk about the strategic planning process. I'd like to let you all know that this will be the last meeting um, where we have the privilege of being represented by Ms. Dobbs. She has taken a position as the administrative law judge for board of parole hearings, and Ms. Dobbs has done an outstanding job in providing guidance to the board, and I want to thank her for her outstanding service to us. Wow. embarrassed Miss Dobbs but we do things outside of work and she's my dance partner when we go to a Jane Austen tea so I will I will still get to see her so um, and so if Miss Miller would come forward uh, Miss Miller actually works for the Department of Consumer Affairs and will be assisting the board through the strategic planning process I've asked her to come and provide some background on the process so the members know what we will be doing in the upcoming months we're lucky to have Ms. Miller assisting us as not only has she done several board strategic plans, but in looking at her background, she also um, has work experience working for a board and a bureau under the department. So that's also helpful when we are working with individuals so she knows our lives. <laughs> um, so Ms. Miller, can you please walk us through the process? Yes, thank you. Um, so my understanding is that you all have in your board meeting packets the strategic plan roadmap. So I'll be using that to walk you through the general process today at pretty much a high level and I'm happy to answer any questions you have um, specifically about the process. But um, as, the, as the roadmap shows, we start with a preliminary meeting. So my understanding is this will take place in third quarter. So probably about July or August, um, your strategic planner will meet with um, the executive director or her designee to kind of get a sense of what the board is looking for with the strategic plan. Um, this could be, you know, logistics for day of planning session. Um, it includes, you know, whether um, we will carry over those strategic objectives that were um, determined for your, your previous strategic plan or if the board has a different focus and would like to take on new um, uh, goal areas. Um, once um, the, the preliminary meeting has taken place, uh, your strategic planner will start working on probably the most um, used resource that SOLID provides for strategic planning, which is the environmental scan. So we do that based on SWOT analysis. So again, part of the logistics that'll be determined is um, the scan usually consists of uh, stakeholder feedback. So that the breadth of that feedback would be determined during that, that preliminary meeting, how many stakeholders you would want to reach out to, and that's done via survey. It's also um, board member interviews. So um, they, the planner would start reaching out to all of you to interview you about the strengths and weaknesses of each goal area. And then it, can, uh, it would include executive director feedback as well as staff. Um, and again, this is as determined in that logistical first session. Um, that environmental scan data would be compiled into you know, an environmental scan document and then provided to you all in advance of the strategic planning session so you could have um, kind of, it's, it's a pulse assessment based on those who provide feedback on, on how they believe you know, the board is doing with regard to strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, after that, you have your actual planning session where the facilitator will meet with you all, and this is where all the work is done. You, you know, we, we would facilitate an actual day of or, or two days um, hammering out objectives that you would like to see in your future plan. Um, and then thereafter, the board has the opportunity to, once, once you uh, review and approve the plan, 
um, determine if you would like to work with SOLID again to develop um, actual a uh, action steps, delineating how each objective would, would be um, achieved with, with steps per you know, staff involvement. And I believe you did that with your previous plan. Um, but that, <laughs> that covers the roadmap. Um, pretty, uh, again, high level, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about the process. Thank you, Ms. Miller, and mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Ms. Kirschmeyer. Uh, you know, Kim goes at uh, the speed of Tesla 90D, 0 to 60 in <laughs> 2.6 seconds. Uh. So it just, it's just to keep up, tough to keep up with, but uh, you have any questions to Ms. Miller first and to Ms. Kirschmeyer, board members. Dr. Levine. Just a, a logistical question. Sure. Um, you talked about a day or two of yeah. of strategic planning with the board. Is that subsume a board meeting or does it replace a, in addition to a board meeting? So, oh, oh I, I'll please. So, <laughs> um, just so you know, we, we talked to, um, uh, I can't think of Damon's last name. Nelson. Nelson. Mm -hmm. We talked to Mr. Nelson about this. Um, because our board is so busy, we may try to cram it all into a afternoon um, of a Wednesday before the board meeting. So we're in negotiations on that. Okay. Um, and I don't know, Ms. Miller, what your experience has been of how that works when you do a half uh, afternoon versus a full day. But it, my thought would be to put it around a board meeting because you always have that date, already have those dates scheduled out. So it might be that we skip, <laughs> if we did a half a day maybe on Wednesday and we decided that we needed both days when we meet, then maybe we could do skip panel, me or not panel meetings, but um, committee meetings and do the next afternoon still discussing the strategic plan and then do a Friday board meeting. So that's, I'm trying to keep it within our current board meeting schedule. And, and SOLID does um, prefer in an ideal situation as, as close to an eight hour session as possible because this does allow for um, sufficient brainstorming and then um, I neglected to, to cover with the roadmap if the board it determined that they wanted to take an opportunity to revise their mission vision and values then that would be incorporated into that planning session day as well um, certainly we are flexible and we'll you know work with the client to the clients needs but if, if we have our our way we would like to lean toward eight hours as much as possible and I think we haven't actually had a full-on board strategic <clears throat> planning session. We revised the last one, but we haven't had a really brainstorming heart-to-heart -heart session, I, I want to say, since about 2010, I think. So um, it, yeah. it's probably needed in time. I think so. I, Dr. Levine probably knows better than anyone else, <laughs> but uh, I came in the end of 2011, and I, we haven't had one. Uh, Dr. Bishop. I just want to say that I participated with your team on the PA board, uh, okay. and it was quite, quite good. Thank you very much for your help. I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I just also want to uh, thank Mr. Warden and the licensing staff. I know he retired, but they have done an amazing job. So we just, if we can get the enforcement, not the committee, enforcement into a manageable timeline, I think we'll be happy. So. <laughs> So that takes care of item 11. Can, uh, Dr. Ganani? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, Dr. Levine. Just a question came in, I've lost track of this. Is, does the sunset review include the, the, or have we had actually the interested parties meeting on changing the, the requirements for licensure? So we actually had, did we have one or two meetings? We had one, I know. Um, and then we set out information and asked for feedback. The sunset does include that as an issue. And um, what we're doing, we're looking at two along those same lines is not only extending that to three years, but then with that extension, removing our um, medical school approval process. Okay, great. I just lost track of yeah. the issue. Thank you. So it's written in there. So we'll see how they write it up as an issue. We're hoping that they take it on in that sunset item. Any public comment? Come on in. Hi, uh, my name is Janie Thacker. I'm a uh, residency program director for maxillofacial surgery at Loma Linda University. Um, I had uh, heard of also about the, the increase in requirements uh, to three years of ACGME accredited uh, postgraduate training. 
Um, and I don't know if you all are familiar with the, the sort of the nature of our program, but uh, our residents begin with the dental school, they complete that, and then they go on to medical school and, and um, residency training. Uh, our, uh, the majority of our training is in oral maxillofacial surgery, which is CODA accredited, um, and most programs will uh, grant a one or two year certificate in general surgery. Um, the California program, as far as I know, including Loma Linda, are a one year certificate. Uh, so this could substantially affect uh, not just our program, but the other California programs. Um, and I was wondering what the, uh, how, uh, what the sort of realistic timeline of this is and um, if it's going to affect the residents that are already enrolled in our programs at six years. And uh, we do have a few that are still going to be finished prior to 2020, I mean, after 2020. I actually, uh, thank you, thanks for coming. And um, just to uh, give a conflict of interest, uh, Dr. Takar works in my department at Arrowhead Regional Medical Center, where she is a part of the Loma Linda group, which provide the oral surgery services. This is a special issue when it was brought to my attention that uh, these are a DDS and MD. These people are uh, both went to dental school and MD school. And when they finished oral surgery residency, they were getting both dental license and medical license. So this change of uh, going from one year of to three years of AG, ACGME program uh, makes them ineligible for MD license, even though they went through medical school and they went through full training to be an oral surgeon, which is comparable to ENT. So I, I talked to Kim, and we will seriously look at, and our goal is not to jeopardize that. That's all I can tell you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, any other audience comment? Any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone. Thank you. Any comments, Kim? Okay, that takes care of that item 11, right? We just finished. Okay, huh, this is an interesting item. We're moving to item number 12, update on marijuana task force, Ms. Kirschmeyer. So the Marijuana Task Force is actually going to be meeting on February 8th of 2017 to discuss the board's current statement on recommendation, recommendations for marijuana for medicinal purposes. The task force will also hear from the director of the Department of Consumer Affairs um, on the California Bureau of Medica Medical Cannabis Regulation. Um, it will discuss Senate Bill 643 that passed in 2015, and it will review the uh, guidelines adopted by the Federation. The task force will hear from all interested parties regarding potential changes to the board's guidelines or statement, and then work with staff on drafting any revisions necessary. So that's my update. Are there any questions? Yeah, any comments from board? Public comment. Come on, sir. Please take a seat. My name, is, my name is Fred Gardner. I'm the editor of a, of a journal of sorts called O'Shaughnessy's. I've been covering the medical cannabis story for 20 years and have been covering the medical board for longer than that, on and off. Uh, when Ms. Kirschmeyer said that the task force and its upcoming meeting would hear from interested parties, that's not, they, they've put out the agenda and they've said they will look at material submitted in writing by February through February 5th. That's not the same as an open forum where interested parties are, are putting in their two cents. Uh, I came here to Sacramento today to put you on, on notice that you're being used as pawns in a, in a game by big players back, in, in, back east. And the, te the um, guidelines that the Federation unanimously um, approved in, at its event in San Diego last year, were drafted uh, by the F Federation's lobbyists back in Washington. They're, they constrain cannabis clinicians in, in several important ways. Uh, apparently, uh, Dr. Krauss can confirm this, 
the, the task force has backed off one of the important ones, which would constrain cannabis clinicians from using cannabis themselves medically with the approval of their own physician. They're not going to be taking input on that, on that at the ta next task force meeting. I don't know if that's a uh, stepping away from what the FSMB is pushing, but there, um, you may have seen an exchange in the December 13th issue of JAMA between some doctors from the Society of Cannabis Clinicians and uh, Dr. Chowdhury of the FSMB. And in, in that, the, um, the doctors had noticed some serious discrepancies between the guidelines adopted in San Diego that uh, Ms. Kirchmeier and Dr. Krauss voted for and the, quote, summary of the guidelines presented by Dr. Chowdhury to the readers of JAMA in his, in his viewpoint. And um, he answered in the December 13th JAMA, he did it again. He, answered, he, he basically misrepresented what he had written the first time. So my uh, appeal to you today for your own sake, for your own honor, is to ask your task force to look into the discrepancies between the guidelines adopted by the FSMB in San, at, at its convention last year and the summary that Chowdhury uh, published in JAMA. And the, there should be input. You, what, to, to put it simply, I think you should ask Chowdhury what he was thinking, how he thought he could get away with this. I know we live in an age of fake news, and this might seem like I'm making a mountain out of a molehill. He just added a few little things and subtracted a few little things. But I, I'm calling your attention to it because you're party to it. And Please uh, conclude. You, I've put some of these materials online at beyondthc.com. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Koshmar. I would just like to clarify that for the task force meeting, we have actually put out an agenda that calls for individuals to submit things in writing before the meeting because we'd like to get as much information before the meeting. However, the meeting will be open to the public and any individual will be able to come there and make comments on each of the agenda items on there. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other public comment? May I make a comment? Uh, yes, Dr. Cross. Uh, it should be known that the FSMB is merely an advisory organization without authority, and each state medical board uh, takes its own action cognizant of the FSMB but not bound in any way to follow uh, FSMB uh, guidelines. Additionally, to the extent that you have referenced articles and debate in journals, uh, it may be of use to uh, the task force meeting uh, to have those references uh, sent to Kim ahead of time so that those who may be attending the meeting will have the privilege of rereading those prior to the task force meeting. Thank you, Dr. Cross. Any other comments from the public? Any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone. Okay. Thank you all. We'll move on to I item number 13. <laughs> Update on collaboration with the Osteopathic, Osteopathic Medical Board of California, Board of Registered Nursing, Board of Pharmacy, Board of Podiatric Medicine, Physician Assistant Board, Ms. Kirschmeier. So this was actually an item that was requested by the board that we begin developing this collaboration with other boards. And we've actually had two meetings of this group um, since the last board meeting. A meeting was held on November 18th and discussions included enforcement best practices as well as wellness programs within each of the boards. Another meeting was held on January 10th, and at this meeting, the group discussed inter-board investigations and talked about the importance of sharing information when an investigation by one board indicates that a violation may be occurring by a licensee from another board. In order to ensure all entities are aware of this important function, the group actually determined that a memo would be drafted and provided to the Division of Investigation and to the Attorney General's Office requesting that if any evidence indicates that another licensee may be violating the law, the matter would be referred, referred to the appropriate board. In addition, we identified key individuals to contact if a violation is found earlier in the process, such as within our central complaint unit. And individuals specifically that we could contact to each of those individual boards and get a direct access to. 
An example recently found was a case where I was filing an accusation and it appeared that a nurse practitioner was not following the standard of care. In that regard, I contacted the deputy who was assigned to the case to ensure the matter had been referred to the Board of Registered Nursing, and if not, to please do so. So that kind of collaboration we really want to work on amongst all of the boards. Um, the group wants to bring this issue to the attention of everyone processing cases for DCA boards. Therefore, the memo is going to be drafted. Other items discussed included working together with the pharmacy board on corresponding responsibility issues for pharmacists when we are investigating prescribers, cures usage, and the corporate practice of medicine. These meetings have actually been very invaluable and I want to thank the board members for recommending this collaboration. At the next meeting, we will discuss setting a future meeting for the board presidents <coughs> within those organizations um, to meet as well. Are there any questions? Any public comment? Any comments on the phone? Thank no you, comments, Mr. Uh, Ms. Kirschmeyer. So this last item is actually, it's my true pleasure and honor. My good friend and past president of the board, Mr. David Serrano Sewell is here. David, welcome. Just to give you a little uh, thing on David, David served on multiple committees, outpatient surgery setting task force with me, together we did public outreach, education and wellness committee, patient notification task force, panel A, executive committee and so on and so on, vice president and president. Uh, David was a leader in consumer protection and public and uh, pay physician education. I would like to ask my good friend, Mr. Serrano Sewell to come forward for, to recognized by the board for <coughs> putting his time and everything he has for the benefit of this board and consumer protection. There, David, thank you. Okay, David, so we'll do it. Oh, we can't open these things. So. I'm opening it. <laughs> yeah. So, this is from the board, and I haven't opened, so I do not know what's in there. <laughs> Thank you. We actually miss you. I, uh, we thought you're going to be here for longer, but uh, decided not to be. So, thanks for all your service, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, uh, <laughs> yep, we're going to ask him, but. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's, you know, it's, um, I have to, I have to wear glasses now all the, so that's something that has definitely changed <laughs> since I last saw you all, but I do want to say a few words. One, that it was an incredible honor to serve on this board. Um, the, the, the mission and the duty of this board is so important. When I first got on and became president and vice president, I asked Dr. Levine, what, what should I be thinking of? And she said, consumer protection, obviously that's the mandate, but to elevate the practice of medicine. That is the charge of the medical board. I thought it was true then and it's, it's definitely um, uh, true now. I know that you're busy. It sounds like you're busy addressing a lot of important and, and compelling issues for the public. So thank you for continuing to do that. And I have been keeping myself very busy. Um, but when you have a great experience, you do miss the people, right? And I have to tell you, that's what I miss most is um, working with all of you. First and foremost, uh, Kimberly, who's amazing, who does a phenomenal job as the executive uh, director, but her hardworking staff, the legal team, also want to say thank you to Lisa. She always does such a great job in organizing uh, the meetings and getting the notices out, but all the staff that is, uh, uh, t takes a hand in, in producing these medical board meetings, a lot of work goes into it, um, so thank you. I don't know if there's anyone from the Attorney General's office here, but I always, I want to, hello, hey, I didn't see you over there. Good to see you. Good to see you, Gloria. Thank you for all the work that you do and your team. It's just incredible. The Department of Consumer Affairs, um, incredible partnership, but uh, most importantly, the, the, um, the public, the interested parties that come to the meetings that keep, that kept, that kept you, it keeps you and kept us informed um, and the associations, and it's that input that 
creates a better work product. So thank you. I'm going to open. Yeah. I'm going to open one of Absolutely. these right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, that's your time the board gave you. Thank so you. you. Can thank do you. Anything with it. Uh, Claire's in fifth grade. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never good at this. This is awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for being patient. I didn't wrap it, so. Someone's a good wrapper. Save the paper. I love the color, right? I still don't know how to wrap, so don't ask me. I, you did a good job. I don't know how to good opener. Anyways, okay, here we go. Wow. This is pretty nice. Oh, you're all lovely. Yeah. Let's hold it up, David. All right. Let's hold We're going to take a picture. Hey there. Uh, hey. BFF. Yeah, we got it. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Thank you, David, and uh, truly appreciate you coming. But as uh, expected, you came on time rather than too early and sit through the meeting again, even though you're not on. So uh, with that, I think we'll have a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. Any objections? Okay, we're adjourned till tomorrow.